So my name is Jacob Diamanti, and I'm a theoretical physicist, as we all know. And it's not the first thing you think about when you think about theoretical physicists, but we know how to fall in love, and this actually happens all the time. And so today I'm going to tell you about the first time I ever fell in love. And I've always been a bit obsessed about learning, and I used to spend quite a bit of time in libraries. And this is when I first, you know, part of my time in the library was just exploring, and this is when I first started to learn about quantum physics and also uh, computer science. And so when I heard about the idea of quantum computing, which was to take uh, the principles of quantum physics and to use those principles to accelerate computing, I became very fascinated. However, at the time, there were no books on the topic in the library because it was such a new topic. Okay, and so I had to order one, and at the time I think there was only one book really available, and so I bought this book, and I was very glad I did, and I ended up becoming so fascinated with this topic. Um, I read the book literally so much, it actually fell in two pieces. Okay, so I taped it back together again, and I solved all of the problems in this book, and I wanted to know more about the subject. Okay, and I heard these stories about there being this crazy company on the, way on the other side of the border, way up north in Canada, and so what I did as a young man is I, I sent him an email saying, you know, I'm interested in your problems. Can you give me these problems so I can solve them? Okay, and they liked this idea of someone wanting to solve their difficult problems so much that they just invited me up there to come work for them. And that is when I met my first love. Okay, it was a problem. Okay, it was a physics problem. And this problem was so important to this company uh, that it would ultimately determine its future direction. So they needed to know what the minimum physical resources were required for them to build a machine that could constitute being called a universal adiabatic quantum computer. Okay, and they put me in an open office to do this. Okay, and I managed to solve a couple of problems in this open office, but this problem that the story is about today, this problem required deep concentration, and this open office was not working for me. Okay, so one day I actually, I rose up from my cubicle, and I don't remember getting permission to do this or not, uh, and there was an old closet kind of in the back corner that we weren't using, and I just sort of made that into my office. Okay, now, this closet was not large, and I think there was some kind of, I remember there being some kind of printer in there that was maybe left by the previous company. I had to kind of pull everything out, and, you know, it was about two meters by two meters, or six feet by six feet. It didn't have any windows. There wasn't a light. There actually wasn't even electricity. So I had to get a, an orange extension cord, and kind of plug it in outside and just sort of run it inside the closet, get myself a little lamp. The desk from my cubicle was far too large. I had to go next door to the experimental lab and get a table, essentially. And so you can picture me, I'm a pretty big guy. And I would work in this very small closet uh, with the door closed, and the world disappeared. I removed all of the auditory and visual distractions of the open office. But you know what I discovered? There was a huge distraction left, a huge distraction the most distracting thing ever. And I think it's true for all of us that we are our own biggest distractions. And so what I found was I was very focused on this problem and my thoughts would wander. So I had to learn how to concentrate and I had to accept the fact that the only thing that matters was to solve this problem and so all other thoughts were tangential to that goal and therefore not important. And I found that if I concentrated and relaxed more, I could spend more productive time thinking. Now, when I started at this company, it was a research and development company with about 16 people. And they got venture capital, and they wanted to grow. And so for all of you that know about companies, you know when it's time to grow, it's time to hire people, and this is very technical, actually. And so you can't just go and hire people. You have to get a human resources executive, which we did. And she's a very nice, very friendly person. I remember her a lot, and I remember one day, she knocked on my cubicle. Well, no, my, my closet, actually, sorry. So she pulls me out of the closet, and she says, I'm making this thing. It's this fantastic thing called an org chart, a company organizational diagram. And actually, I talked to everyone in the company, and I wasn't really sure where you fit in on this. Okay, can you tell me who you report to and what you're doing? And, you know, I was thrilled about this. I said, you know, there were two people responsible for hiring me, one of whom left before I got there, and the other one shortly after I arrived. I've solved a couple small problems, for you already, but now I'm really focused on this problem. And she didn't, you know, we were speaking really different languages here, okay? She did not see the beauty in this. 
Okay, that I was just, you know, I was encouraged, uh, encouraging myself to solve this, and the company really wanted to know. And I'm actually not sure if I ever made it to this org chart or not, but I do remember having kind of a concerned conversation with her where she thought it was really important for me to be on this org chart because I could move up then and I could be promoted and I'd be more stable. And I ended up telling her, I said, you know, for me, a theoretical physicist, you only have a limited number of problems here that are interesting. And this is it. If I solve this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off. I'm going to hit the road. And, you know, I don't know. She accepted it. And the company gave me the freedom to continue completely alone, completely unsupervised, just me in the closet. And I stayed there for a couple of years doing this. And, you know, as time went on, the company did grow around me. And I don't know what people said looking back at it. And I think it's only excusable to have someone living and working in a closet at a quantum computing company. Okay, and this brings me to one of my points here, that oftentimes we're concerned about, you know, what the world around us thinks. Okay, and we're always said, you know, everybody always says, think out of the box. And so my out of the box solution was to put myself inside of a box so I can do more thinking. But this is important because in life, I think, you know, it's a challenge for me to always innovate so I can become increasingly more productive throughout my life. And it's a challenge for everyone to do that. And I think the important point here is there was a resource for me that worked that no one else recognized as a resource. No one would have ever given me permission to move into that closet, I think. But once you're there, no one's going to kick you out either. And so it's important to recognize those small resources that can really help you be more productive. And time did go on, and eventually I found a solution to this problem, but that's really when the trouble started. It went from being very fun and exciting to being very stressful, because I had to check it. So this particular problem was not an easy problem to check. And the way that I would describe it to someone that doesn't know about the problem is to, it's kind of like a Jenga puzzle. We have all these little pieces of wood, and if one of them is positioned wrong, the whole thing falls down. And I remember getting up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, every day, seven days a week, and I would go to work every single day, Saturday and Sunday, for months. And all I would do is just check this result and kind of go over everything again, just to try to convince myself that it was right. Okay, and I even went to the art store and got like giant, um, you know, giant pads where artists use them for drawing because the equations are so long. And um, it was, you know, quite interesting, and I think, Another important point about that is in life and in innovation and in companies, oftentimes there's kind of an obvious next step. And so everybody does the same thing. But I think it's important, and I'm glad I had the experience, to you know, be the only one working on one thing at one point in my life. And I think that's important. So um, also, you know, I do things very differently now. I still don't like open spaces. I still prefer to work alone. But I had to teach myself how to be more productive, such that the most productive part of my day was spent thinking the deepest. And that slightly less productive part of my day, you know, those few hours will, will be spent organizing myself so I can continue to do, you know, what I enjoy, which is doing research. And then for the rest of the day, I don't think about anything at all that has to do with work. And that's very important. And so after I solved this question, you know, everybody, even though I said all along I would leave, after I solved this problem, that was it for me. And I remember everybody at the company, they were very surprised and sad that I left. And, you know, to this day, um, I'm glad I did. You know, my path was not to move up in the company, but it was to go and pursue more theoretical physics questions. And to this day, I run into these scientists who are still at the company, and they're very thankful for what I did for them because they used my work. And I'm very thankful that they gave me that experience that I wouldn't have been able to get at anywhere else at that point in my life. And, you know, I went to Harvard to do a, um, a research position there. And this is, you know, this is for me, this is two and a half years now in a closet, so I'm out of the closet for the first time. But after a couple weeks, I fell in love again with another problem. I'm Jacob Monty. thank you for listening.